Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome. I uh, hope you're enjoying your time at UCSC. Uh, my name is Josh Cap, and I'm a recent grad. I studied molecular biology, and I was a part of College 10. Uh, I really enjoyed my time here uh, as an undergrad at UCSC, so I'm happy to be here to uh, uh, welcome you to this uh, teach-in with Associate Professor Beth Shapiro on how to clone a mammoth. Uh, Beth earned her bachelor's and master's degree in ecology from the University of Georgia, and her uh, PhD in zoology from Oxford University. Beth is the director of the, uh, <laughs> sorry, Beth is the director of the Evolutionary and Conservation Genomics Center here at, the, at, here at UCSC and the co-director of the Paleogenomics Lab. Uh, among her many accomplishments, she is a Rhodes Scholar, a National Geographic Emerging Explorer, and was named a MacArthur Genius. Uh, Beth is a major reason why I have a passion for paleogenomics research, and I feel really lucky that uh, I get to hear her ideas frequently. So I think you're really going to like this talk today, and please help me welcome Beth Shapiro. Thanks, Josh. You can sit, probably. You don't have to sit in front of everybody. That way you can, you can pick your nose or whatever and no one will notice. I'm just kidding. Thanks, Josh, for saying that. Uh, now, Josh knows, knows more about me than, um, than anyone else in the lab, so I appreciate that because <laughs> he had to memorize all that stuff. <laughs> Anyway, thanks to you guys for coming out and uh, giving a, an hour or so of your time while you're uh, reminiscing about your time here at Santa Cruz to listen to me pontificate about the possibilities of bringing extinct species back to life. Um, I'm giving this talk. I, I've worked in ancient DNA, as I'll tell you in a little bit, for a while, um, but uh, recently moved into the world of science communication, and I wrote this book, See How to Clone a Mammoth, and uh, yeah, it was published last year, and uh, so if you're interested in the stuff that I have to say today, then you can check out this uh, lovely book here. Um, anyway, a little bit of senseless advertisement, painful to painless here. Anyway, How to Clone a Mammoth, this is what I'm going to talk about. So I thought that I would begin just by showing you a little bit of what it is that I do. Um, now, this thing that I'm about to show you is slightly embarrassing, but I think it sets the tone appropriately. And it is one of the first things that I did wearing my hat as a, an explorer for National Geographic. I was out in the field a few years ago in one of the field sites where we commonly work, which is in Canada's Yukon, uh, near Dawson City. There are active gold mines out there. And where there are active gold mines, we find lots of bones. So this short video um, is is a little bit of the exploration that we do to find the bones that we bring back to the lab. So this is really cool. What we've just found, you can see, is one, two, three, four pieces of mammoth bone here. This is part of a vertebra, so you can see how big this is. And the neat thing about this is that these are the small pieces, which means that the stuff is washed downstream. See, these pieces are actually still frozen in the permafrost. We can't get them out at all, which means they're going to be really well preserved. Just heard that big splash of water back there. That means another hole's broken through. Here comes the water. We better get out of here. <laughs> I told you it was a little embarrassing. In my defense, though, that water is really gross, right? <laughs> so what, what that is, is during the spring when the snow melts, the gold miners collect the water from the melted snow in these big holding ponds, and then they pump it up and wash off this permafrost, which is the frozen dirt. But that permafrost isn't just dirt. It's dirt plus decaying plant and animal material that's been frozen for anywhere up to the last 700,000 years. So when it melts and is exposed to the sun, it smells pretty awful and you don't want to get covered in it when it comes rushing through the muck. Josh is going to get to experience this firsthand this summer for the first time, and I'm putting him in the muck instead of me. So, uh, so I am a biologist, and you might wonder why somebody who's a biologist collects bones, much less collects them from decaying, rotting bits of permafrost up in the Arctic. Um, my research is actually focused on climate change, and if you're interested in climate change and you pay attention to what we hear about climate change in the literature, 
literature or on TV, you might be used to seeing images like this, right? Where we're learning about changes and patterns of precipitation and storm abundance and, and diversity and extremes. And we're seeing lots of places that used to be very wet, like California, becoming much drier, like California. This is not California, actually, because we did get a little bit of rain. Um, but this could be us in future if it doesn't keep raining. We hear that these changes in patterns of storms can cost millions of dollars and cause lots of damage along coastlines everywhere. And of course, climate change is pushing some species to the brink of extinction. And if you read about climate change in the popular media, often what you hear is that everything is awful, right? That's pretty much it. Like, we're doomed. Everything's terrible, right? But as a biologist, what we might be interested in, rather than just thinking about how terrible everything is going to be, is what can we do about it? How are the species and ecosystems and communities that we are associated with, as we share this world with, going to, going to be affected by the types of changes that are in anticipated to happen in the next 10, 20, 100 years. Now, one thing that is pretty common, both in the scientific literature and in the popular literature, is this plot. This is known as Michael Mann's hockey stick graph. It's called a hockey stick graph because it's kind of like a hockey stick on its side, right? This is a proxy for average global temperatures that's taken from ice cores um, and oxygen in ice cores in the North and South Poles. And what you see is, over the last thousand years, temperature, global temperatures, remained approximately the same. This black line across here is the present day, right? They're remaining approximately the same until the last hundred years or so, when all of a sudden they skyrocketed. And, and there are projections that take it way up to here, or maybe up to here, etc. But the climate is definitely changing. What's less obvious, or less well known, is that this is not the first time in Earth's history that we've seen a very rapid increase in global temperature temperature. In fact, if we look back across the last 100,000 years, and here is the present day temperature, and we're missing the recent skyrocketing here, um, we just, it's not plotted here, this is the average global temperatures over what's called the late Pleistocene. The Pleistocene is the last epoch that we were in. And right here, you see a very cold interval, followed by a rapid increase, again a decrease, and then another rapid increase. And this is the transition into this warm interglacial interval that we're in right now. So what I do, what people in my lab do, is we go back across this entire 100,000 year interval and we collect the remains of plants and animals that lived throughout the duration of these rapid past periods of climate change and temperature change. And we can ask, using the DNA we, cover, we recover, how species and ecosystems and communities responded to these past periods of climate change. And the goal of this research is to enable ourselves and other scientists to make more informed decisions about how species and communities are going to be affected by climate change that's predicted to happen in future. We can learn from the past because this is not the first time that we're actually seeing this happen. The field that I work in is called ancient DNA. Pretty self-explanatory what that means. DNA, that's old. I don't mean grandma. I mean 100,000 years old. We're going back to actually these bones of these animals that used to be alive during the last ice age. The place that I work is, uh, is called Beringia. This is Alaska right here. And this part of the world, for those of us who remember past election cycles, is the, the, the region of the world that Sarah Palin can see from her backyard, right? Remember this? See how it's kind of lighter colored around here, yeah? That's because the sea level is more shallow. And during the ice ages, when much of the planet's water was taken up into making massive glaciers that sat on top of the continents, the sea level was lower, and all of this land area was exposed. And this formed a very nice bridge that animals could walk across between Asia and North America. And things like um, horses went in this direction, and camels went in this direction, bison went in this direction, and people also used this land bridge right here to move from Asia into North America during the last 20,000 years. So this was a very important part of the world for, um, for uh, generating the diversity of life that we see on the continents today. 
So today, Beringia looks like this. I'm actually in this helicopter with shadow hair on the ground, and I'll show you that helicopter in a minute, because it's awesome. Um, but in the past, it looked more like this, where we had a very rich diversity of animals consuming a rich diversity of plants. And this landscape was actually a lot different than it is today. So here we have mammoths and mastodons, different species of lions. There were giant hypercarnivorous bears called Arctodus that stood up 14 15 feet tall when they stood up, we killed them. You probably understand why. Wouldn't want them in our backyard either, right? And so it was a very diverse area. So we can go out into this place and there's that helicopter I was telling you about. Isn't it great? Yeah, it's really good. You might notice that um, there's actually some glass missing from some of these windows, right? That's really helpful because after we got on that helicopter and loaded all our gear and we were packed into the inside, sitting on top of these massive gas tanks that take up much of the space in inside, and the Russian and French team leading the expedition decided to celebrate that we'd finally taken off. We tried three times and worked on the third time uh, by smoking. Um, it allowed you to breathe better from the inside while you're sitting on the gas tanks. Um, so we travel <laughs> in this uh, fantastic uh, bit of machinery, and we stay in five-star accommodation when we're out in the field. Um, this is a picture that I took by just backing up from my tent and slightly unfocusing the camera lens so you can get an idea of the depth of field of mosquitoes that one deals with up in the Arctic. And we wander around everywhere that permafrost is melting. So this is again, this isn't the, those last pictures were in the Timur Peninsula in north central Siberia. Um, this is in Canada's Yukon again. This is the same location, not the same gold mine, but the same location where that video was shot. Um, here we have the, the placer mining, the gold miners are spraying this water up against this frozen dirt, and as they're doing that, what happens is all of these bones from things like mammoths and mastodons and bison and horses, they just come out of this dirt, whole, really beautiful pieces of bones, and we can wander along and collect them. And here are some folks that are from my team that are looking around, trying to figure out where there are bones that they can pick up, and they stop doing this for a little while, and we'll go and walk over to the place that they've just recently washed and see if there's anything that's still in situ, still in place, frozen in that permafrost. And in a day of working at a place like this, we can collect somewhere between 20 and 30 bags like this of bones. So that's a lot of bones. This is mostly, here's some bison and some, there's horse bones in here too, some caribou here, muskox, a bit of mammoth stuff up here. Um, every now and then we get things like bears and lions. These carnivores were much less abundant, so we get many fewer of their bones, but we get tens of thousands of these bones. And we take a tiny little chunk of them. This is just a regular Dremel tool that you can buy at uh, Home Depot. And take that little tiny chunk back to the lab, grind it up into a fine powder, and we can extract DNA from that chunk. And then we can use the DNA sequences that we get from these different bones to learn about how big the populations were and how those population sizes changed over time. We can trace the movement of different animals over space. We can watch horses going from North America into Siberia and ask when they went and how many of them went. And we can figure that out just by looking at the sequences of their DNA. And we've learned quite a lot about how these past populations of animals responded to the last Ice Age by doing this. Uh, for example, we've seen populations of bison and horses and mammoths become their biggest peak in abundance around 35,000 years ago. And this is important because the two leading hypotheses about what caused the extinction of these animals and the near extinction of bison are that either we hunted them to death, people hunted them to death, or the Ice Age killed them. But the peak of the last Ice Age was about 22,000 years ago in North America, and there were not large numbers of people here until around 12 or 14,000 years ago. So that these populations began to decline 35,000 years ago, 15,000 years before the peak of the last ice age, suggests that we don't yet know really what was going on. It also suggests that we as people probably weren't to blame at least for the initial stages of the declines of these animals. I'm not quite willing to let us off the hook for eventually driving them to extinction, but we can talk about that later. 
We've also seen populations of carnivores like bears move really quickly and, and, and with large populations across the landscape following these herbivores as they're dispersing from place to place. And we've started to really get a handle on why some species like caribou have done so well and survived to the present day, while other species like cave lions have gone extinct. And a big clue is not liking to live where people do. So as I said, I don't think we're really off the hook here. But in any case, I think that the work that we've done over the last couple decades has been really interesting. We've started to make good inroads into understanding what causes some populations to be more vulnerable to extinction than others during different time intervals. And when we publish these papers, we often get calls from journalists who want to hear about our research and write about it for different journals, even popular media journalists. And I'm always excited to talk about it. But in the end, what I've found is that they actually really only want me to answer one question, which is, um, so what does this mean about how close we are to being able to bring one of these things back to life, hey? And so, because there isn't really a, a sound bite sized answer to this question, I decided to go ahead and, and write this book. So this field, if we can call it a field, has started to become known as de-extinction. Now, I really hate this word for lots of reasons, not least of which because it is very hard to conjugate. What are you supposed to say that you have done if you have brought something that is extinct back to life? Are you supposed to say you de-extincted it or de-extinctified it? Anyway, it drives me nuts. But it's very easy to understand what it is, and we're all quite familiar with what it does because we were there the last time we successfully brought species back to life. <laughs> And since that went so remarkably well, of course we should consider doing it again and in real life instead of science fiction. <clears throat> All right, so Jurassic Park. The, what happened in Jurassic Park? Everybody remembers, right? How did they get the DNA? Amber. Amber, that's right. So it turns out there's no DNA in amber, sorry. Uh, amber is very porous, and it's also formed in a very hot place. Hot is bad for DNA survival. That's why we work in the Arctic, mostly. And porous is bad for DNA survival because bacteria can get into that amber, and then they just chew up. They catabolize any DNA that's in there. We've tried to get DNA from these insects preserved in amber, and so have lots of other groups. And nobody has successfully recovered DNA from anything that is older than about 700,000 years old, or and dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, <laughs> or that was preserved in amber, or even the very recent precursor of amber, which is copal. So of course, there are dinosaur bones, but these bones are rocks, right? And we can't get DNA from rocks because they're rocks, right? <laughs> which means that we can't clone dinosaurs. <laughs> Yet. Never. <laughs> of course, these mammoth bones, and you saw those massive vertebrae that we were pulling out of that frozen dirt, and that I was pulling out of the frozen dirt in that first video, these massive vertebrae are incredibly well preserved, these mammoth bones. And so I think that, and people have asked me, you know, why did you write about cloning a mammoth? Why a mammoth? And I genuinely think that when people discover that you can't bring dinosaurs back to life, they just naturally choose mammoths next, right? Why? I don't know. Ask all the people who are choosing mammoths. But you know, they're big, they're friendly, I guess. You know, they haven't been extinct for very long. And we know that we have very well-preserved bones. Not only that, but we have incredibly well-preserved mummified remains of these different animals. And now we even have remains that I'll show you pictures of in a little bit of mammoths that were pulled out of the permafrost from northern Siberia that looked like they had blood associated with them. So these guys are incredibly well-preserved. And while I talk to you now about the technology required to bring these things back to life, Life, I will go through the different plans that have been devised for cloning a mammoth. All right. So the first plan is to clone it, right? So cloning is the thing that comes to everybody's mind when you first think about bringing an extinct species back to life. But cloning is actually a very specific scientific technique. And the scientific name for this technique is somatic cell nuclear transfer. So we have two different types of cells in our bodies, mostly. We have somatic cells and germ cells. Germ cells are sperm and eggs, unfertilized haploid cells that would normally come together, fuse to create a zygote that would go on to become an actual living organism. Somatic cells are everything else. 
So what happens during development is after you have this sperm and egg that fuse together, the cells that you initially have are pluripotent stem cells. They are capable of becoming any type of cell, indeed every type of cell, that's necessary to make up a living organism. As development proceeds, the cells specialize. You get skin cells or heart cells or liver cells or brain cells, and as they're specializing, they are becoming more and more stuck in doing whatever job it is that you're doing. So the trick to somatic cell nuclear transfer is to take one of those somatic cells that has a very specific set of instructions, genes turned on and genes turned off and things being expressed at different levels, to be that type of cell and trick it into reverting into a very early type of cell that's then capable of becoming every type of cell to make up a body. So the first successful clone was what? Dolly the sheep, that's right. So Dolly the sheep is somatic cell nuclear transfer. What happened here is scientists took a mammary cell from Dolly, so it was a cell that was very specialized, it had a specific set of instructions to be a mammary cell, stuck it in a dish and stressed them out, starved them of nutrients so that they didn't, they were pretty stressed out in their, in their little cell. At the same time, they took an egg cell, which was unfertilized with a cell and a nucleus and the DNA, or half of the DNA. This would normally be the thing that is fertilized by a sperm and then go on to become an entire sheep. But what they did was they sucked this nucleus out of here. So you have an empty egg cell and a stressed out bunch of somatic cells, put them next to each other, zap them with a bit of electricity so the membranes burst and the nuclear material from this stressed out somatic cell dumps into this empty egg cell. Then you zap it again and the proteins in that egg cell cause that cell, that's now fertilized, it's already fertilized because this somatic cell is mom and dad already there together, cause it to forget all of its instructions necessary to be a somatic cell and revert to that early stage stem cell that can then begin to differentiate and divide and become every type of cell necessary to make a whole new sheep. You get a different type of sheep, you don't need to. They did in this experiment so that they could tell when the animal was born that it looked like the donor of the mammary cell and not like the egg donor or the maternal host and grow it up and voila, you have an identical copy genetically to this animal that lives right here. So that's pretty straightforward, right? How would we do this with a mammoth? We go out into Siberia, we find one of these incredibly well-preserved mammoth remains, we take a cell, we put it in a dish in a lab, we stress it out, starve it of nutrients, we find an egg cell somewhere else, probably from an elephant, right? We suck out all the material in there, dump them in there together, it does this little magical zappy thing, grow it up into an elephant, a mammoth is born, and you release it into the environment. Pretty easy, right? Straightforward? Maybe not so easy. So the problem with somatic cell nuclear transfer with something that has been extinct for a long time is that it requires a living cell, a cell that's still alive, that you can put in a dish and starve of nutrients. And no matter how well preserved these different animals are, the remains of these animals that we're finding in the Arctic, there are no living cells in any of these organisms. As soon as an organism dies, the DNA in all those cells begins to get broken down into smaller and smaller pieces. The sun is a terrible thing. You UV rays hit those cells, the DNA starts to break down. It happens to us too, but we have proofreading enzymes that go along and fix those mistakes that happen because of UV hitting our skin cells. Otherwise, every time we went outside, we'd get cancer. Of course, once an organism is dead, you don't have the capacity to repair your DNA, and it starts to break down into smaller and smaller pieces. The DNA is also eaten by all sorts of stuff that is in there. The gut of a mummy will burst. Our guts are filled with microbes, bacteria that will circulate throughout the bloodstream, find the DNA in those cells and just chew it up, chomp it down into smaller and smaller pieces. When the bone is buried in the ground, all of those microbes in the soil will attack that DNA, chewing it up, breaking it down into smaller and smaller pieces. And we are never going to find an organism that's been dead for several thousand years or even several hundred years or even several years where there are living cells remaining in that organism. And where there are no living cells, we will not have any clones. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> I'm just kidding. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. That was plan A. Plan B. Right. Okay. So, 
I've been telling you that we can sequence DNA from these different bones and tissues that we're finding in the permafrost. And we know, because there have been recently several mammoth genome sequences published, that we can sequence enough DNA from these things, broken down pieces, to get together all of the A's, C's, G's, and T's, the letters that make up your DNA code, that make the proteins, that make you look and act the way you do, to create something that is an elephant. And in the computers around the world, we now have these four billion letters lined up next to each other, and we know what a mammoth genome should look like. So the idea should be that we can get that genome, map it onto chromosomes, we can then synthesize those in a lab, stick those in the thing, get the, all of this stuff, and that'll be easy to do, right? <clears throat> okay, so why isn't that going to work? There are a couple of, of reasons why we can't just sequence ourselves a mammoth. Um, and, and first of all, uh, I think I've said that we do have a couple of uh, complete mammoth genomes. I'm going to have to qualify complete just a little bit when we talk about this. So this is UCSC. We're pretty famous for having finished the human genome sequence. David Hauser's group here, you know, three cheer, four thousand cheers for us for doing that stuff. So how many mammalian genomes do you think are complete today? Any guesses? One? Just humans? You're not going to give scientists any credit for anything other than humans? I'm not talking to you, Brahman. I know you know the answer. <laughs> Less than 10. That is correct. There are fewer than 10. Okay, Brahman, how many? Zero. Zero. That's right. There are no complete genomes sequenced yet. Now, I'm not really being fair, right? Uh, with the human genome, we do have almost all of the genome complete. And we have nearly all of the genome that we think does anything interesting, the part of the genome that actually has the genes in it. However, there are lots of parts of the human genome where there are these tightly condensed, repeated regions where all you get is like A-T, 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 A-T for a really long time. And there is no existing sequencing technology that makes it possible to actually read through these regions of the genome. So even for the human genome, there are places where we don't know the actual sequence. And that's for something where we genuinely have, you know, billions of billions of little letters that we've generated from lots of different organisms. It's actually a, a quite a, a bigger problem when you're thinking about something that's extinct. So the way that we assemble a mammoth genome I'll tell you about it in just a minute, but I'm going to first tell you the two, two reasons why it's hard when something is extinct. The first reason is that the sequences that we can recover from these bones are not long. Instead, they're short and they're tiny and they're full of chemical damage from the kind of things that are getting in there and breaking down from water and oxygen and UV. So if you imagine that I could extract DNA from something that's still alive and the long beautiful DNA strands I could get out are like party streamers, then the DNA that we recover from mammoth remains are more like confetti, right? But not confetti that's as nice as this. Um, so I went looking for like the confetti that you would be able to find the day after a parade where there was a lot of elephants in the parade and maybe it rained before you were able to sweep it up and you know there were a lot of people there doing gross things but nobody has pictures like that on Google. So this is what we're stuck with here. Uh, so we have these tiny little short gross broken fragments of DNA. And the second problem is that if I take a piece of mammoth bone and I extract all of the DNA that's in that bone and then sequence all of the DNA that I've extracted, I will find that not very much of the DNA that's in that bone is actually mammoth DNA. So if I were to swab my cheek or take a piece of my hair and extract DNA from it, most of what I recovered would be me. If it was a cheek swab, it'd be about 90 to 95% would be my DNA, and the rest of it is bacteria from the inside of, of your mouth. For this mammoth bone, we did this first experiment where we, the, um, this ability to sequence everything that's in a bone is really kind of new. It's only within the last decade that we've been able to do this. And so we took a mammoth bone, and uh, it was 
2005 or 2006 when we did this, and we extracted DNA, and we sequenced everything that was in that DNA. And then what happens is there's this online database of every bit of DNA that's ever been sequenced by anyone ever, and you can take your fragments, and you get billions of them, and then one at a time, you can ask the computer, what does this fragment of DNA match most closely that's on this massive online database? And the computer will do this billions of times for all the data that you've generated, and then you get a chart like this that tells you what the DNA actually is. And with this mammoth bone that we found from Siberia, it was about 25,000 years old, we did this, and about half of the data that we recovered, closest, close, the closest match to this was elephant, right? Now, it wasn't mammoth because at the time, in 2005 or 2006, there wasn't a mammoth genome that was available yet. Remember, we were first people to be generating this data to make the mammoth genome. So we found that about half of it matched the elephant genome. So we assume that that's probably mammoth. The rest of it was just other stuff. There's a lot of unidentified, probably soil microbes. There's much more diversity in the soil than that's ever been sequenced before, so we don't know what that is. Right? There's a lot of environmental DNA, some viruses. We got some contamination. We always find this kind of stuff. Maybe we contaminated that bone, we were pulling it out of the ground, or there was a little bit of human DNA that was circulating in the lab, despite that we work in a specially designed, clean facility to make this happen. But about half of the DNA that we recovered was mammoth. And we were pretty bummed by this, right? We thought, this is awful. Um, I mean, all the DNA that we need is going to be in there, but every time we generate DNA, we have to throw half of it away. So that means that it's going to be even even more expensive to generate these ancient genomes than anything else. It turns out, in retrospect, this was an awesome sample. 53% of the DNA that we wanted was elephant. Most of the time when we're looking at this kind of thing, it's less than 5%. In fact, the first bones that were used to sequence the Neanderthal genome by Svante Pabo's group in Leipzig, they used five bones. All of them had less than 1% hominin DNA, and that includes human contamination, right? So they were throwing away 99% percent of the data that they were generating and just had to keep generating more and more data and grinding up more and more bones until eventually they were able to recover the whole thing. Fortunately, they're of Max Planck and have more money than they know what to do with, but, you know, they were able to do that. that if you were in my regular class, I would have to ask you to leave right now because of that. <laughs> Or I'm going to take off points on the quiz that I'm giving at the end, right? <laughs> I'll raise the quiz so I'm willing to take the damage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> So there's not, not much mammoth DNA in there. So not only are we looking at this, should be much more disgusting than this piece of confetti, but we're actually only looking for the purple pieces amidst all this kind of stuff. So it's really a mess. It's hard to get together this genome that we're going to sequence. And the way that we do it is we have better quality genomes for things that are alive. So we've been able to sequence and assemble genomes of elephants and of humans. And if we have a mammoth bone or a Neanderthal bone, we can go and get that sequence on our computers, and then we take the little pieces of DNA that we've said are mammoth or are Neanderthal, and then we ask, we write computer programs to figure out where along that previously sequenced mammoth elephant genome or previously sequenced Neanderthal genome these little tiny fragments go. And that is how we slowly but surely piece together different pieces of DNA. But this is kind of a problem, because if you think about it, if there is something that's really important, that's different between the thing that's extinct and the thing that's still alive, and all we have is a pattern from the thing that's still alive, but what we're looking for is the bit that doesn't match that pattern, then we're at a pretty big disadvantage from the start when we're doing this. So if this is our goal, if we're going to sequence a genome and stick it into chromosomes and do it this way, we're kind of stuck at the beginning. So that particular plan is pretty much a no-go. Fortunately, there is another way. And this is the way that people have been talking about actually bringing extinct species back to life. And the idea is to use genome engineering technology, some of these cool new genome editing ideas that have been in the news quite a lot recently, to gradually cut and paste our way from an elephant to a mammoth. That's right. So, in order to realize how this might actually work, it's most important to first know that if we have an elephant, 
we already have 99% of a mammoth. Asian elephants and mammoths are diverged from each other by around 5 million years. There's about 1% of their sequences that are different from each other. We now have several different Asian elephant genomes and several different mammoth genomes. We can compare them next to each other on a computer and we can figure out exactly where they're different. It turns out that's about 1.5 million differences in a 4 billion base pair genome. So once we've lined these genomes up and we've figured out exactly where those differences are, we can use these genome editing technologies to swap out the elephant bits for the mammoth bits in the places of the genome where they're different and end up with an elephant cell that has a little bit of genetic modification, making it look more like a mammoth. So to explain how this might work, imagine, this is not what it looks like, Imagine that you had a tiny little programmable robot that you could send into a cell with a little package. And that package contains information about exactly where that robot should go and a DNA sequence that matches the place of the genome where that robot's going to go. You inject that robot into the cell, it swims around all of the chromosomes, figures out exactly where that message has been programmed to go, and grabs a hold of that bit of the genome, and then it makes two cuts and snips out part of the DNA. So this is how it works. Um, this is a CRISPR-Cas9 molecule. I'm not going to tell you too much about what that is. There's been a lot of it, a lot of talk about CRISPR-Cas9 in the news. It's really powerful and really scary. We're not going to talk about why it's scary right now. We're only going to talk about why it's cool, right? So imagine, here's your CRISPR. This is your robot. You've been able to program this guy. So this is a guide RNA. And it's got this bit of DNA that exactly matches the sequence that you're going to edit. Here's the point where you want to change the elephant version of the DNA sequence to the mammoth. So you send your robot in there. This little thing is the robot. And you send it in with, go, with your little package. And in that package, you have a synthesized bit of DNA, some ACs, Gs, and Ts that you've stitched together in the lab and injected into that cell with the little robot. And that is the mammoth version of the sequence that you want to paste in there. The robot finds the DNA by grabbing a hold of here, this CRISPR, and it cuts it. It cuts it in half. Now your cell doesn't like it when the DNA is snipped in two because that's bad. That causes cancer. So evolution has created a couple of different mechanisms to fix these cells. And one of those mechanisms looks for DNA that matches the bit where it's broken. Now every one of our cells, remember, has two copies of each chromosome. One from mom, and one from dad. So what evolution will do, what the evolution has, has advised, devised for this to do, is to find that other chromosome, line it up next to the chromosome that's broken, and then use that as a template to fix it. But what you've done is overwhelmed the system by sending in a whole bunch of this right here, which is also the same as what's around here. And what you want to happen is for this bit to line up next to this, and for the cell's repair machinery to use this little fragment instead of the other chromosome to fix that break. And in doing so, you have pasted in the mammoth version of the DNA instead of the elephant version that used to be there. So now you have a strand of DNA that's mostly elephant-like, except for that tiny little bit of mammoth DNA. And if you can then use cloning to turn that into an elephant, you will have an animal that is mostly elephant-like, but a tiny bit like a mammoth. Right. So we can do this. What exactly do we change? There's about six million years of evolution there. We're looking for maybe one and a half million differences. We can't do all of those yet. The, the technology just isn't good enough to make that many changes at once. So for now, the idea is to focus on a few different parts of the genome.